Romans 12 at verse 9. Let's pray together. Lord, there's so many voices to hear. May we hear your word. May your spirit speak to us. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Romans 12 at verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be hope, joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it, is, it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I listen to those words and I think, how can we do this? How can we possibly do what Scripture says here? Honor other people above ourselves. Well, well, well maybe we can do that one. But, but to bless people who persecute us, to refuse even the desire for revenge? How can we possibly, how can we possibly do something like that? How can we possibly do this? Almost as soon as I read those words, I thought of a book that was on my shelf, and I've read these words a number of different times. And I went over to the shelf, and I pulled down this book, a book by E. Stanley Jones. And I remembered reading these lines. On a large scale, we are taught to hate. An American general speaking before an audience said, at the close of this war, this is back right after World War II, at the close of this war, we must hate. We must hate, hate, hate. And vigorous applause greeted the statement. Suppose we do that, what will happen? We will go to pieces, for life is not made for hate. Hate is not the way. But it seems to be the way today. It seems that we are permitted and we're even encouraged to hate. We have so many things that are separating us, so many things that are dividing us. We are encouraged, we're entitled to hate. But here the Apostle Paul says some incredible words. He, he says, love must be sincere. He says in verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Verse 19, do not take revenge. The Apostle Paul is talking entirely differently than what we're hearing most of the time today. Way different. But maybe the Apostle Paul has it wrong. Maybe he has it wrong. Maybe he didn't get the story straight. Maybe we're not supposed to do this. But he sounds just like Jesus. He's echoing Jesus. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What the Apostle Paul says here is exactly what Jesus was saying. And he tells us something that is not being said very often today. 
It's just the reverse. Let's get our bearings here for a minute. If you, if you read through the book of Romans, for 11 chapters, for 11 chapters, the Apostle Paul is telling us of what God has done for us through Jesus. He's telling us of this magnificent work that God has done, this fabulous work of Jesus, that, that in the fullness of time, God sent Jesus into this world. And even though we had rebelled against God, gone our own way, doing our own thing, forgetting him, God acts in a decisive way in history through Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection. And now as a result of what Jesus has done for us, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The Apostle Paul says this is a new day and age because of what God has done once and for all through Jesus. This has happened. This is the era in which we live, and this is who we are if we are in Christ. And then finally, after telling us about that fabulous work for 11 chapters, the Apostle Paul gets to the point where he says, and now, here's how we are to live. Here's how we are to live as followers of Jesus Christ. This is the way of Jesus. This is the way that Jesus is calling you and me to live. This is what he wants us to do. This is the road that he wants us to take. This is how he wants us to live. And if you describe that way of Jesus that the apostle is talking about here, we can put a couple words on it to label that way. And one of the words that we can use is unpopular. Unpopular. This is not the way most people want to live. This just doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem to be the way we should go. If you were hiking through a woods and, and you came to a point where there was a fork and so you could go left or you could go right and one path was well worn that's probably the path you would take. I know Robert Frost talks about taking the road less traveled or the path less traveled. Most of us take the path that's ordinarily traveled. Spiritually speaking, most people do not take the path that the apostle is calling us to follow here. We don't like the direction. We want to go a different way. I can remember many many years ago. It was so many years ago, I wasn't even a minister at the time. Where, and I was talking to the, this lady at work. And um, as I was talking to this lady, and I was just this young guy, and she seemed really old, probably about my age right now, you know. And, and, and when I was talking to her, I mentioned a name. I don't know why that came up, but this fellow's name came up. And when I mentioned his name, as soon as I mentioned it, she said, I hate that man. It caught me, off, uh, uh, it caught me in surprise. I hate that man. And then she went on to tell me what, what that man had done to her. Now, I've heard a lot of worse stories since that in the years I've been in the ministry. I've, I've heard a lot of worse stories of what people have done to each other since that time. But when that woman was telling me that story and telling me uh, that she hated that man, and this is the reason why, I was just a young guy, and I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to respond. Now, there are lots of times, well, I shouldn't say lots of times. Most of us have somebody that we can confide in. You can't confide in 100 different people, but maybe you have somebody in your life that you can confide in. And so you, you can talk frankly with that person and you don't feel that you'll have that person's judgment on you if, if you tell them what's on your mind, what's in your heart. If you're honest with them, they, you trust them, you love them, they love you. You, you, you can share with them. Can't do it with absolutely everybody, but you trust that person. Well, sometimes we use that, uh, that opportunity and then we tell that person something and we tell them something that has happened, something that someone has done to us. That's the way it usually goes. We tell them how we've been mistreated. We tell them what happened. And usually we expect that person to agree with us because you are, you're my friend. You agree with me. You say, yeah, that's bad. That's awful. And it's okay to say that something was bad that was awful. It's okay to agree with a person. 
But there also comes a point where we have to say, but you know what, you're going to have to let it go. You're right, you got hurt or was wrong, but you got to let it go. You cannot harbor, harbor that. You cannot. And so if you get a friend that's a good enough friend, a person who's trusted enough, they, they will hear you out, they will not judge you, but they will stop and encourage you and say, hey, mm -mm. you've got to let it go. That's the way of Christ. That's not the popular way. That's not the popular way. We want to hold on to it, and we think we can. We're entitled to hang on to our animosity. We can do this. We can. But it's not Jesus' way. Jesus talks about blessing our enemies, not repaying evil for evil, not taking revenge. This is not the popular way. This is the difficult way. So if you want one word to describe the way of Jesus that the Apostle Paul is talking about here, it's unpopular. And secondly, it is difficult. C.E.B. Cranfield says, this is clearly opposite to what is natural to us. This is opposite. This is not the way we're wired. John Kelvin, John Kelvin, this is a little, little bit old sounding, but, but listen hard. Although there is hardly anyone who has made such advance in the law of the Lord that he fulfills this precept, no one can boast that he is the child of God or glory in the name of Christian who has not partially undertaken this course and does not struggle daily to resist the will to do the opposite. Kelvin says, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this doesn't come naturally, doesn't come easily. But if you're not trying, don't say that you're following the way of Jesus. Do not. Do not. Even though you fail, you mess up over and over again, you keep at it. You keep at it. Well, here's the truth this morning. You and I sometimes are offended by somebody else. Sometimes you offend me. Sometimes I offend you. Sometimes someone in your family offends you. Sometimes you offend somebody in your family. Sometimes there is a friend, a worker, that you're offended by that person. Sometimes we're treated badly. Sometimes we're treated in ways that we shouldn't be treated. It happens. Sometimes people treat us badly. Sometimes we treat other people badly. But I don't think any of us here knows what it means to be persecuted. Offended, yes. Treated badly, okay. Persecuted, no. We don't know what that's like. And we don't want to know what it's like. But verse 14 says, bless those who persecute you. Implied is that there are Christians, maybe many Christians, who will be persecuted. That's implied. It will happen. Today, it's happening for a third of the Christians in this world. Take a look, watch this. Around the world, the body of Christ is under attack. A congregation forced out in Algeria. Bibles burned in southern India. A Christian's home destroyed in Vietnam. And in China, an unregistered church is demolished. Just in the top 50 countries on the 2020 World Watch List, so many Christians are beaten, attacked, tormented, and killed for their faith in Jesus. In fact, right now, more than 260 million Christians live in areas of high persecution. That's one in eight Christians worldwide. 
Each year, the World Watch List tracks persecution against Christians around the world to help us understand what's happening in the global church and how we can pray and support our suffering family. As I stand here in China, I can tell you that behind the numbers is a story that challenges and inspires my faith. China is number 23 on this year's World Watch List, but that number doesn't tell the whole story. I wanted to find out the truth behind the ranking. I've been all over China, and I can tell you that it's an incredible country with breathtaking beauty, an amazing culture, and a history second to none. But the church here tells a different story. Christians are increasingly being pushed underground in China. Pastors are being detained. Churches are being closed. And people who have a personal faith in Jesus are being watched using technology that was never available before. The church is being squeezed in China. But sometimes when the church is squeezed, it grows. And China is just one country on the 2020 World Watch List. Christians around the world are being pressured, targeted, and attacked. The Christians in the top 50 countries on this year's list may be suffering, but we can stand with them in prayer and support. We invite you to join us in 2020 as we stand with our sisters and brothers around the world. Open Doors is serving in over 60 countries around the world, standing with the persecuted church. We'd love for you to join us. We are one church, one family. Sometimes we might be offended. Sometimes we are treated badly. But we don't understand what it's like to live being persecuted. According to that video, one out of eight Christians lives in a place and, and, uh, where persecution is real. They, they referred to that map. If you can put up that map, please. If you take a look at it, or look at the very top. If, if you look to the top right, high persecution is yellow. Very high persecution is orange. And uh, extreme persecution is the deeper orange or whatever. So if you take a look at that, that's a whole lot of the world. Of course, the northern part there, you're, you're up in Russian territory, and they say that that's yellow, that's high persecution. You, you drop down into, into China there, of course, and China says very high persecution. This map brings out 50 nations, the 50 worst nations for, for persecution. Then, of course, you see that deeper color yet. You see one little spot over to the right there. And, of course, that's uh, northern Korea. And it doesn't surprise us that northern Korea is the place of the worst persecution for Christians today. But then you drop down here to Indi India, Pakistan, uh, Iran, and those are countries there that you see listed as well of places of deep persecution. Interesting thing is Mission India has been going for a number of years. Uh, just uh, John DeVries just passed away. God has done a magnificent work through Mission India and other places. But, but India is supposed to be a place where there, it's a pluralistic society. And, and it doesn't matter if you're Christian or Hindu or Muslim. They're supposedly living together in harmony. But obviously that's not happening. And so you can see that uh, through that, uh, all of Asia, it's basically all of Asia, there's persecution happening. The, uh, the, the northern half of, of, of uh, Africa, persecution. You see one spot here in South America, Colombia is, is, is on that map. Places where persecution happens in a way that you and I just don't understand. And so you say, well, what do we do? What do we do? Well, first off, just being aware is an important thing that this is going on, making us aware that, that not every Christian lives the way you and I do, and, and to be thankful and, and to give God praise for the blessings we've received, but then to remember we support organizations. Mission India is, uh, is something that our church supports, but to support then, to be aware and to support. And let, let me mention three places one is Mission India. Another is, is, is uh, the Voice of Martyrs. Or if you go online, it'll come up as persecution.org. 
So the one is missionindia.org. Another is persecution.org. And the third, that where this video came from, uh, opendoorsusa.org. And if you go to those places, you can learn. But what's more interesting than that is the fact that you can go to some of those websites, at least two of them, and, and you can get hooked up with them so that you can pray for people specifically. And one of those websites, you can even write people who are in prison currently, and, and they can get your mail. Uh, you can write to them and encourage them of those who are being downright oppressed and imprisoned for their faith. There are things that we can do, and we must not forget them. We must remember them. We must pray for them. And, and to encourage us to get specific, to pray for somebody and most of us are not going to do this, but to encourage us to even write someone and let them know we care. But even though you and I are not going through that kind of persecution, but we are called by Jesus Christ to remember those who are, even though we are not going, to go, we are not going through that kind of thing presently, we still have to take to heart these words that Jesus or the Apostle Paul says to us. We still have to remember what he says, and these words do apply to us. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In an increasingly fragmented society, which is encouraging us, to resent our, our enemies, to hate other people, and a nation divided in so many ways, racially, socially, politically, economically, and even religiously, you and I are called to follow the way of Christ. It's very unpopular. It's very difficult. But it's the way of Jesus. It is Jesus' way. Let's pray together. Lord, you've called us to live in such a different way. You've called us to support those who are in desperate need today. May we do that. May we not forget them. And may you work so powerfully in our lives that we become people of, who follow Jesus so faithfully that we live in a wholly different way. Not popular. So difficult. But Jesus' way. In your name. Amen.